the current standard of care based on NCCN guidelines in treating patients with advanced lung cancer and skeletal metastasis, skeletal-related events, is to add either zolindronic acid or denosumab to the upfront systemic anti-cancer uh, regimen that's already being administered. In this segment, we'll briefly discuss the management of uh, SRE, skeletal-related events in uh, lung cancer. And I want to start off with uh, you, Heather, just to give a brief overview on the role of either zolindronic acid or tenosumab okay. in uh, those patients with bone metastases. Right. And so um, we've known for quite a while about the benefit of bisphosphonates in patients with uh, bone metastases, and zolindronic acid has been sort of the, the go-to drug for quite a while. Um, it's a relatively easy infusion. It doesn't have to be administered that often. It's sort of three to six weeks, and I often kind of spread it out a little bit to coincide with the chemotherapy. Therapy. Um, usually quite well tolerated, though occasionally patients will have a flu like event when they're getting the treatment, which can last for a day or two. A couple of folks I've had have had bad arthralgias that were an issue. Um, but then more recently, we have the rank ligand inhibitor, denosumab, which is a totally different class of agents, um, which has been compared head to head against zolindronic acid um, with the idea that patients. Um, you know, really looking at an end point of the skeletal related events. And so that's going to be a fracture um, or something that's really impeding the quality of life. Um, and in that setting, they're, they're both very active agents. Um, and I think trying to pick between them can be challenging. The denosumab is an injection as opposed to an infusion. So that can be an advantage, especially. Particularly if they're not getting intravenous chemo. Especially for patients on oral agents um, with targeted drugs. Um, and I, at least in my practice, I, I haven't really seen that same uh, level of this flu-like kind of febrile illness, and so that's been an advantage. Um, but I think there's a heated debate about them. There has been at least, a, there, there are a couple things out in the literature retrospectively looking at um, survival outcomes and saying that perhaps there's an advantage to the denosumab, and I find that intriguing. It hasn't really led These to- These are post hoc retrospective. Post hoc retrospective analyses, and so- In lung cancer specifically. In lung cancer specifically, and so one must look um, at those with a skeptical eye, um, but but intriguing, and I think if you're trying to make a decision, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll weigh in that direction, especially if a patient comes in and, and asks specifically about that. Um, one thing I, I did want to say is for, for my patients, when they come in and they have um, bone metastases, if it's a single bone metastasis, I don't always start these agents right away um, because they're not without toxicity, um, and some of that toxicity is the frequency of having come in to get an injection, especially if they are a patient who's on a targeted therapy. Who you might not see otherwise uh, beyond every two or three months. Who might not see as frequently. Yeah. Plus, in a patient who has an actionable mutation who's on a targeted therapy, their response rates are so good, it's not as clear to me that we're getting as much of a benefit. Now, if someone comes in with extensive bone metastases, I'm going to have them on one of these and agents. And these studies were generally done in patients who were um, getting either chemotherapy or no, uh, not, not targeted e therapy. Exactly. And so we don't have as much data there. Um, and, and so I really look at sort of the volume of bone metastases as I'm making a decision and talking with the patients. I always will talk about the drugs, even if there's only a single bone metastases, but I won't always start in that starting. setting. So that's sort of my practice with them. So I think they're really an important adjunct. It's a, a really a critical part of therapy for patients with bone metastases, but it's not a every single patient reflexively needs to be on them. And the, I guess the other advantage for denosumab is the relative lack of renal toxicity, which we can see mm -hmm. with uh, zolindronic acid. Right, but you do get the osteonecrosis of the jaw. Both of them. With both, both of them. Um, and I think for the patients where we're, we're seeing folks who are actually living years now, especially if they have an actionable mutation and or untargeted drugs, a big quality of life that becomes issue. a big issue, especially if you're going to be getting the um, femoral neck issues, which can be seen mm -hmm. with long-term administration. And so I think we do need to do more learning for the patients who are going to be the longer-term survivors about how do we fit these drugs in, maybe up front for a while, maybe spread out the frequency of dosing, maybe give breaks. I, I, you know, I don't have answers to those, but these are important questions we need to be thinking about as our patients are living longer. Ben, do you routinely give this in the setting of bone metastasis or those who've already had skeletal-related events? I do. I would agree with <clears throat> what Heather said. I think we need to keep in mind that skeletal metastases remain a, a problem for our lung cancer patients. Up to 40% of lung cancer patients will develop skeletal metastases at some point. I think the choice of zoledronic acid for, versus denosumab is, is based uh, on a lot of things that Heather mentioned. Uh, tolerability, need to factor in uh, creatinine clearance, uh, the risk of hypocalcemia with denosumab. Uh, 
generally in my practice, I do offer denosumab, uh, and that's based Preferentially, on... Preferentially, ahead of zolendronic Yeah, acid. and I think that's based, uh, again, on the data that we've seen. Uh, some of it um, is uh, exploratory subgroup analysis, uh, particularly the data that was published uh, recently showing a survival advantage. Again, 800 patients that, that looked at, again, an exploratory analysis showing a survival advantage in retrospective, nevertheless. Um, I tend to... Uh, believe that uh, denosumab is a little better tolerated than, than, than zoledronic acid, although I think both are very active. The Europeans are actually carrying that forward and uh, doing a prospective randomized uh, trial looking at denosumab in the mm. setting of yeah. uh, bone net, specifically with survival as an endpoint. Mark uh, Sosinski? Yeah, you know, I struggle with this decision all the time in my practice. You know, very often we have skeletal meds, we'll all admit that, but very often lung cancer is not a bone dominant disease. Um, and so it adds an extra layer of supportive care. Um, as we've pointed out, there's an inconvenience, cost and toxicity issues with all these patients. Uh, so I um, have used it, I, I think, much more selectively and have favored uh, zolendronic acid rather than uh, denosumab in, in general. I see a lot of patients in second opinion. Uh, my colleagues around seem to be using it more than I am, uh, and, and I don't know, um, you know, who's right there, but, but um, I, this is a tough decision, I think, for, for, for a number of different reasons. Mark, Chris, a potentially contrarian view? Well, no, no, I, I agree pretty <laughs> much with, uh, with Mark. I mean, the truth is, if, if you have an effective cancer therapy, you don't need this. Right. You heal that bone, you don't mm -hmm. need denosumab or zoledronic acid. We tend to use zoledronic acid. We were involved in clinical trials many, many years ago. Uh, just one quick thing to bring up um, as a uh, kind of a clinical point. Um, I think all of us here had experiences using uh, kyphoplasty in patients with symptomatic uh, uh, vertebral vertebra body mm -hmm. uh, problems. Uh, and it's, I think to a person, it's been very, very effective. And it's, it's one of the few things we have that gives almost instantaneous benefit the next day the patient's better. I think a lot of people backed off from it when they saw general medicine trials about the, the lack of effectiveness of, of uh, kyphoplasty. And I urge you to, to think about that as a good strategy for our um, uh, patients with lung cancer that have uh, uh, spine problems uh, that are And painful. we frequently do see uh, uh, heightened incidence of compression fractures even outside of the metastatic setting, certainly in locally advanced disease. <coughs> this has been uh, yeah. an issue within yeah. the radiation field, right. and inevitably it's misinterpreted right. as a new bone met. Not mm -hmm. necessarily the case. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And th there may be a real role for these drugs mm -hmm. because, uh, yes, we've well, irradiated them. I, I, I'm sure we've all had that same case. Somebody who has, yep. you know, a new bone mat right smack in the middle of radiation and they, right. they're, they're <coughs> CR or near right. CR, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and it's not cancer. Right. And a, a similar point of, as with the bone flare. I don't know if you've all seen this, but especially with the very active drugs, sometimes as a patient gets started on the drug, their next scan shows new oh. bone lesions, which in which fact are, are misinterpreted not new. as bone progression. Right. Um, yes. and, and this, uh, I think, was something we really hadn't seen mm -hmm. in lung cancer, though it's been reported in other diseases until we had active drugs. So I've seen it with bevacizumab, but especially with the targeted agents. I've seen it both with or without uh, the bone-specific uh, agents. Right. And so a word of caution, I think Mark's brought that up before. You look at the patient. The patient's doing better. That's not real. They're, yeah, they're pain-free, but their yeah. bones are looking more sclerotic. Right. But you everything have a report else is shrinking drastically. Yeah. You ignore mm -hmm. the report. The reports are pretty vasy, actually. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think you underscore the fact that we really need to talk to our radiologists about this, particularly in the absence of pain, because when we put patients on studies and they are looking for documentary evidence of their disease status, inevitably we have to write some sort of note to the file or <laughs> some other contrary a note uh, yeah. uh, indicating that we do not believe this to be true progression. So this is a, a very interesting topic. Um, some hope perhaps that denosumab uh, may actually enhance survival, although that's not been proven in a prospective randomized trial. Certainly. Um, delay or potential prevention of skeletal related events and the ancillary care of lung cancer, I personally think it has made a difference. Uh, I've embraced it a bit more certainly than the two marks, maybe on the same level as uh, uh, Heather Wakely. And uh, I think uh, even as we look at new strategies that are directed against the cancer cell, we need to remember that the patients have a constellation of issues that may go beyond that and that ancillary therapy cannot be dismissed. I thank you all.